Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Andrew, Matt, for putting together this conference so that we can be with Ian, with whom we're already walking, working and walking. So thank you for bringing us together. After listening to Alex's presentation and telling us what he was not going to do, <laughs> and then he spoke to the vertical plane, the vertical, the upper chip, I thought, oh, golly gosh, since I am a theologian and a minister, and both kinds of people, as you know, are extremely modest, <laughs> I thought, am I supposed to describe what's going on from the standpoint of God? <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> no, Tande, you're not. <laughs> Ian wants us to see what we have overlooked. He wants us to clear away our assumptions, uncloud our vision. And so if you will, he has invited us on a vision quest. I affirm that Western consciousness has indeed distorted the perception of reality for perhaps, his word perhaps, two millennia. And I acknowledge that we participate in our own demise, not only by systematically misunderstanding the nature of reality, but also by choosing to ignore or silence the minority of people that have intuited it. But whether we will actually be able to give up our misconceptions of reality is not assured. As Ian reminds us, the need for such a transformation is urgent, which is why we're here. But urgency is not a sufficient motivation for personal change of heart. Urgency is not a sufficient motivation for personal change of heart. So removing the expletives, what is? <laughs> what kind of actual experiences by their very nature will liberate us from the entrapments of our mind and tra transform our hearts and our behavior and sustain them and sustain them? I mean, after reading, Ian's book, a husband might say, well, golly gosh, now I'm going to take out the garbage. <laughs> and that lasts for perhaps a week. <laughs> My answer is a safe space is needed to handle the emotions, the fear and rage and panic and distress triggered by environments that traumatize us. But let's start simply by affirming what has already been affirmed beautifully before me and last night by Ian. The depth of his hemisphere hypothesis, as he widely notes, wisely notes, is affirmed by a huge body of evidence confirming the right hemisphere is much more superior to the left in receiving, interpreting, recalling, or understanding anything that evolves emotions. This right rule of right hemisphere superiority with emotions pertains to the neurobiological foundation of human emotions. So the question of course is why this emotional foundation is so often lost to the received traditions of Western consciousness. As Ian has repeatedly demonstrated, my answer is twofold. 
first, trauma prevents the mind from reflecting on emotions that if acknowledged, put the survival of the body at risk. Oh no, mom, I'm not angry. And second, as the philosopher of political history, Eric Vogelin would put it, kind of, the social context which inform the way trauma emerges as an intellectual formation that denies, denies the social origins that produced it. The trauma must be acknowledged and the social context must be changed to produce the results. Ian calls for. So first off, we have to investigate the social context that prevented the trauma for 2000 years. And then we can use neuroscience and neuropsychology and psychiatry to handle it. But I don't want to get us, I don't want us to be abstract. So first I will demonstrate the social context. The brain wisely says, the mind wisely says, no, we're not going to acknowledge it. As you know, I was a television producer, an Emmy award-winning television producer for 14 years. At the height of my career, every Saturday morning from 10.30 to 11, I would sit on my couch and cry. And then I would go shopping. <laughs> I had the clues to why I was crying, but somehow, about a year into this process, I said, I'm not well. And I said, I have a right to be well. And then I said, if I can't figure this out on my own, which I will be able to do, I will see a therapist. <laughs> so a year later, I went to see a therapist. <laughs> And I chose a body therapist. I didn't quite know why I chose a body therapist, but someone focused on the body. And I went in smiling and happy. And the first thing she said to me was, hmm, I think we have to work on your anger. <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, do this. <laughs> and I said, I can't do that. <laughs> so she said, sure you can, watch. <laughs> and I said, I can't do that. And she kept on doing it. Until finally, I burst into tears. I never cried, <laughs> except on the couch on Saturday. <laughs> I burst into tears fell on the floor wailing and saying, don't make me trust you. Don't make me trust you. I trust no one. Because I didn't know. And then of course, the first thing that came to mind was a little gay mom and I used to play. When I was four or five and I frowned all the time, mom would take me into the kitchen, partially inflate small brown paper bag and then say blow into the bag so I blew into the bag then she would hold the inflated bag with one hand over her head and with the other burst it and say grouch gone <laughs> <laughs> which made me laugh <laughs> and I assumed I concluded she was a magician so soon I always had a smile on my face because I lived in Pleasantville, USA. <laughs> My parents were brilliant, truly brilliant people. And I guess the therapist, in looking at my smile, knew that there was trouble in River City. <laughs> so we have to, just as my therapist did, investigate the social context that informed the void in Western consciousness. The loss of betweenness, which is a central claim and issue for Ian, such that a dominant form of engagement, human engagement with others, 
does not uplift Western humanity, but traumatizes it. I begin with a very brief narrative overview of the formative history of Western, of history of trauma in Western consciousness. Very brief, my work, long, Love Beyond Belief, lays out the 2000 year history in detail. The Greco-Roman world of empire brought with it a plethora of torturous experiences that made trauma normative. That made trauma normative. An empire in this way is like a star that collapses in on itself, like a black hole from which no light is emitted. And those black holes happen to be the people of the empire where they're on, the, they're on the top or the bottom. The professor of Armenian and religious studies emeritus at Hebrew University of Japan, Michael Stone, identifies several major forms of this social disintegration in the opening paragraphs, chapters of his book, Scripts, Sex, and Visions, a profile of Judaism from Ezra to the Jewish revolts. Social dislocation. The division of Alexander the Great's empire after his death in 323 created kingdoms that needed Greek soldiers, administrators, and settlers. So all of a sudden, groups found, Greeks found themselves trying to be at home in foreign social environments. Non-indigenous cultural and state identity, social dislocation brought with it dislocated personal identities. Zeno was a Syrian. Paul from Tarsus, but today be from modern, modern Turkey. You had no clue as to the identity of a person in terms of the empire status based on how they looked. Native strangers, these are Stone's terms. Native culture flourished side by side with the cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan cultures of empire. Foreign gods, so the gods that you might have worshiped in your home and tribally were very different from the ones in the temple. <clears throat> new religions, they started mixing up together and forming new religions. Holy Moses, you started to say, home was no longer familiar. Men now felt themselves to be out of tune with the world and sought assurance from religious and philosophic systems that would end their quandary. This was necessary, but not sufficient because we had conditions. We had, for instance, the observant Jews who had permission not to worship the gods of the temple. So even though there were great differences among them, they knew one thing that they agreed upon, that the Gentiles were idolatrous. So therefore they were negotiators. They were Hellenistic, absolutely, but they were negotiating, keeping their own identity while also negotiating with the with the Greeks and the Romans. So meanwhile, the dominant Gentile cultural contexts were not so dis disposed in this way. Were disposed. So the sixth and fifth centuries BCE, as Michael Stone notes, coming to the fore is the idea that man was composed of two parts, body and soul, and that the body contained or weighted down the soul. This idea is pithily expressed by the famous word play, soma equals sema, body equals grave. Having a body was increasingly no longer a mark of pride, but rather an indication of the entombment of man's spirit. Not surprisingly, religious practices and many religious philosophers began to focus on ways to assure the release of the soul or spirit from the tomb of the body, from the tomb of the world. These traumatizing social contexts, of which there were numerous ones, I mean, extraordinary, whether you were at the top or the bottom, you were hurting in this globe, in this empire. So Lewis Mum Mumford, cultural historian of the condition of man, depicts modern man as someone who first took shape in a period of cultural disintegration a slow, painful, largely unconscious process whose meaning did not become plain to him until all hope of arresting it had disappeared. As Mumford suggests, 
a grand retreat took place within the heart of classic civilization at a time when all its vows, vows seemed secured. The increasing desire of the Western mind to separate personal self-awareness from the disintegrative social conditions of its own pervasive and relentless traumatizing environment, and so too from the fear and rage and anxiety and panic and dismay and profound sense of betrayal that triggered it, you have to separate yourself from it. Okay, so much for the social context. I mean, in, in my book, you know, I lay out what happened to Augustine. He said, I'm a fragmented self. And he gave the Catholic Church its first doctrine of human nature as a fragmented self. And he blamed all the things that he felt like the kid pounding on the breast for milk because it was forbidden to give infants milk, you know, newborns milk right away. And so he's pounding on his breast for milk. And he says, looking back on it, I was sinning then. <laughs> so he gives us his doctrine of original sin. The 20th century psychoanalytic, in 20th century psychoanalytic terms, I draw lovingly on the British psychiatrist, theoretician, and pediatrician, D.W. Winnicott. I direct our attention to Winnicott because he explains one way the dominant modes of Western consciousness extracted itself from its own pervasive and relentless abusive environments. It's trauma by creating a disembodied mind. He's recounting the same story I'm constructing but now in his, I constructed with a you know, brief history, but now with his own psychoanalytic, post-classic Freudian theological terms. Several factors must be taken into account here, Winnicott says. I'm gonna summarize all of them. He wonderfully says, there's no such thing as a baby. <laughs> no community, no baby. Toxic community, toxic baby. The toxic nature of the social environment collapsed, resulting in the personal breakdown of the kid. When the developmental continuum breaks up, he says, the basis of a psychosomatic split is laid down. The source of the split is the breakup of the caretaking environment as a sustaining and life enhancing, holding and handling faculty, facility of the of the child. This breakup of the caretaking environment, which Winnicott calls the intermediate area of experiences, can in turn produce within the child an overactivity of the mental functioning. In other words, the condition can be so bad that the mind in this way begins to say, hmm, my environment's not working. I will be the environment from now on. In health, the mind does not usurp the environment's function, but makes possible an understanding and eventually a making use of the relative failure. That's Winnicott. But in an unsupported environment, the mind begins to act as if it is the environment of the psyche soma, and the psyche of the individual gets seduced away into this mind from the intimate relationship with the psyche originally had the, the psyche originally had with the body, the soma. He calls this, and that's a quote from Winnicott, he calls this breakdown the origin of the so-called mind-body problem in Western philosophy. The source of this breakdown is the toxic nature of the environment in which the child and the adult are forced to live. They have their own grouch bag techniques. That's the point. Trauma prevents the mind from reflecting on emotions that if acknowledged reveal the true origins of the assault, the persons upon whom the kid had to depend in order to survive. So the brain says, huh, I see. So can't be mom and dad, can't be the schools, 
can't be churches. It must be those guys over there. And they're told which ones by the environment to pick on. <laughs> the child's mind destroys the emotional integrity of its body to stop it from knowing the source of its abuse, its own parents, caretaker, guardians, social system, et cetera, et cetera. In this way, the ongoing trauma, I define trauma as the ongoing triggering of survival instincts that cause persons to stop, to self-destruct themselves and others to stop the gut-wrenching pain and suffering and end the enormous isolation and loneliness. The results of such breakdowns, Winnicott concludes, is a mind psyche pathologically designed now. Affect is displayed and then hidden. The self wages a war against the self, mind against feelings, heart against heart, head, reason against persons. The affective space between self and other, which Winnicott called, as I said, the intermediary experience, is ruptured. Winnicott's explanation of the intermediate area of experience is akin to what Ian calls betweenness. The remains of the rupture Winnicott describes is akin to what he calls the void. So how do we bridge the void? How can we heal the trauma that keeps us from accessing our right hemisphere? We have to create new environments, safe spaces for experiences of betweenness, places of compassionate engagement with others. The similarity of insights about betweenness by Ian and Winnicott allows us to analyze Winnicott's narrative of the dynamics of the potential breakthrough of betweenness in his remarkable essay, Fear of Dying. He said in this essay, I noticed there were a certain group of clients I had, of patients, who weren't responding. And I tried to figure out what the heck was going on. They said, oh, I see. Their trauma, their assault took place at such an early age that they did not have the capacity to affirm what had happened to them, which is that they suffered a primal agony, which split the self. The self was coming together, the merging stopped. So therefore, what Winnicott had to do was to go back with his patient to the place where the patient died. So that the patient would stop trying to prevent in the future what had already taken place in the past. And they could only do that work with Winnicott, holding them there, which then, because it's a safe place, becomes the container for shifting the trauma to revelation and freedom. A similar story, I'm running out of time, so I will not tell you the second story of therapists who use men who would abuse their wives and their kids and self-psychologists and his only strategy was empathy. First, men didn't care at all what they'd done, but because empathy was his strategy, a year or two into the process, because all he did was empathize, and they started telling him these horrific stories for which they were now being, it was compassion. A year or two in the process, they began because the compassion, that capacity for compassion was now unblocked to feel sorry for what they had done. Okay, good. So, it is here that insights from affective neuroscience give us a way to track how the field of intrinsically distinct vibratory, reverberatory neural patterns of affective consciousness become a, revel, resu, a resurrection story. 
Friedrich Schleiermacher, the father of liberal theology, correctly notes in his brief outline of theology as a field of study, religious feelings is determined by what happens between persons and are communicated by means of ideas rather than symbolic action. So the church, he said in this way, is a community that attends to affect, the displays of emotion. And he called affect, he defined affect like two centuries ago as the product of stimulated nerves or whatever else is the first ground or seat of emotions in the human body. So he made affect, emotions, the primal function of a religious community such that you know the service is working if you feel better after the service than you went did when you go in. He says, how it's handled defines a religious tradition, but the fact that it's handled is the function of any spiritual standpoint. So in this way, Friedrich Schleiermacher gave liberal theology a foundation no one could find. It was no longer God, or human nature is original evil. So I use affective neuroscience, which tracks the vibratory fields, the subjective experiences based on the ability to experience specific aspects of our own nervous system. To translate Winnicott's insights, trauma, and Schleiermacher's insights into contemporary terms. So I'll skip that to show you, to, to fast forward, because it translates. Um, and I affirm in this context too, of course, John Cobb and process studies, recognition as John puts it, that Whiteheadian systems could be thought of as a philosophy of emotion. And Panksept and with his co-collaborator, Georg Norton, exploring in this way the non-cognitive level of human experience that discerns how or even whether there will be further integration of the stimuli within the self coming from the stimulus of the nervous system and then the way in which imagination and memory handles this. So finally, Ian refers to the Japanese word shunyata, because it characterizes the field of betweenness as the generative potential of space. Like shunyata, the term betweenness for Ian refers to potential, the potential place from which something can come into being. Ian also refers to betweenness as the source of human creativity and uses a reflection by the master violinist Isaac Stern to explain the notion of origin of music from this perspective. According to Stern, music is that little bit between each note. That little bit between each note. Silences, which give the notes form. The content of betweenness from this perspective is the silence without which music cannot take form and, take, and, and be noted. So the betweenness, as Ian says, locates music entirely, as he puts it, in the betweenness of tones. But so too, he continues, religion also exists, or rightly understood exists, in that betweenness of human beings out of which music notes emerge. Schleiermacher agrees. Thus does Ian affirm the meaning of betweenness as the emergence from no thing as the emanating sound of something. By so doing, he can lay out the conceptual relation of betweenness to the void. Ian describes the void psychologically as the loss, the emptiness of mental life that appears to go hand in hand with the loss of personal emotion and memory, which is different from silence, shunyata. Accordingly, when the environmental objects and stimuli, stimuli are traumatized by the organism's environment, environmental and social interactions, they are no longer mediated effectively, but rather by a mind that has detached itself from its own feelings as a survival strategy. 
For all of these reasons, I conclude that when, Le when Eon wants us not only to understand what is made evident by his case studies of the void, but also begin to see it in a way that repairs it ourselves in the world, we must open our eyes to the trauma that closed them. I conclude that the meeting point is the space between them, the field of unrealized potentials. Ian draws on quantum theory to explain this field of between us. So do I, writes Ian. The potential is not simply all of the things that never happened, a ghostly penumbra around the actual. The actual is the limit case of the potential, which is equally real. The one into which it collapses out of the many is the particles of collapse or collapse of a quantum field. Quantum physicist Nicholas Geisen helps us out here when noting in Quantum Chance, his book, the difference between two basic units of quantum information associated with a cloud of potential results is zero. Zero is not divisible. The predicates that emerge from this field of potential are thus pure acts of creation, as Geisen puts it, creation from nothing, because the field of potentials is simply infinite possibilities. The voiding of these infinite possibilities is the limiting of potentials, which when extreme and relentless can produce this the psychological void, the trauma, the complex trauma act as actual occasions of experience. The result of this shift from quantum physics to complex psychological trauma is finally captured by James Joyce in Dubliners when he describes Mr. James Duffy as a man who lived a little distance from his body, relegated his own acts with doubtful side glances and made no sympathy for the wretched souls of which civilization had been, on which civilization had been reared. The Western mind lives a little distance from its body. Okay, so final thought, <laughs> where's the redemption for all of this? Small groups, small groups. Many groups, four to eight people who come together simply to listen to each other, to hear each other, because human autonomy is impossible. Thanks, Koha. Salvation is not a solo act. So we have to acknowledge the trauma in our own lives and in the lives of our Western empires, name the nation and then find a small group. Get me to the small group. Um, like, final word, final word. <laughs> Social, cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead was white, right, when she said, have no doubt that a small group of people, of thoughtful people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. She just got the number wrong. We need a bazillion of these small groups. And then we are walking with Ian. Thank you.